Uh, well, thank you very much, and good morning. Uh, uh, I wish I had taped that uh, description to send home to my mother. <laughs> she would have been very proud and then wondered a little bit about uh, Dr. Glenny's credibility on other fronts. Uh, and, and Rob accurately described what was a great privilege for me when I, in, uh, in an American Heart Association study section that we were on together for two or three years, and we would meet twice a year in Dallas, and the night before the meeting would have dinner, and he was overly generous in suggesting that we taught each other about being division directors. I, my recollection is that he taught me a lot, and I tried not to be obvious in taking notes uh, as we sat there. But as much as learning a lot, I enjoyed it immensely. And also through that, I came to know you in a different way. We had the opportunity to compare our divisions. I had moved to being the division director in pulmonary at Hopkins and our departments, and I was struck and I'm still struck by the significant similarities in terms of our people and our orientation and our values uh, in medicine across the broad, uh, across the breadth of, uh, of academic medicine. And so it was a fantastic experience for me. I'm grateful and um, I greatly appreciate this uh, opportunity to come and speak with you this morning. Um, I'm going to have a little bit more to say about Dr. Butler at the end. Um, uh, sadly, I have nothing to disclose, <laughs> but because it's a grand rounds, I will start with a case, um, and there won't be any surprises here. This is someone I saw on the MICU back when I was still doing real work. Um, a 51-year-old woman who was a nurse uh, at an outside facility, had diabetes, hypertension, and a history of a renal transplant, several days of cough and dyspnea, chest x-ray with bilateral infiltrates when she had presented to an outside facility and was diagnosed with pneumonia. She was admitted there, intubated, received the usual care, and over after a few days was transferred to uh, Hopkins to our MICU. Uh, you can see her vitals there. She was febrile. No real surprises with that. A white count of 15,000. A chest x-ray that looked like this, and you can see that there's diffuse infiltrate, silhouetting, silhouetting of the diaphragm on both sides, as well as the heart border. So you know just from the chest x-ray, this isn't just dependent edema. I don't know why we got a CT scan, but we had one, and it corroborates that uh, notion that this isn't just dependent edema. And I put it in the title. This is acute respiratory distress syndrome, right? So this isn't a mystery story. This was first identified as an entity in this paper in The Lancet that uh, Ashball and Petty get the credit for. Sadly, Bigelow and Levine, who were fellows, don't get much credit when this was called out, which sounds like something that should have been righted. But nonetheless, this is referred to as Ashball and Petty, typically. And you know the predisposing conditions. It's familiar. Overwhelmingly, infection is the most common predisposing condition, but there are another of other potential contributors, and the clinical characteristics are similar to what I just described of this 51-year-old woman. There have been a variety of attempts at defining the syndrome, which of course, as you do here, as we do in our place, people are in uh, intensely interested in studying conditions like this. And so there needs to be some rigor and consistency in how you define things. And uh, the most recent adaptation looks like this, so that the timing is within a week of a known insult, bilateral infiltrates that I just uh, showed you, uh, edema that is uh, at least not entirely cardiac, uh, in origin, and severity that is classified by the, uh, the, the, the degree of the uh, oxygen deficit. So Gordon Rubenfeld, who was a faculty member here for a long time, did a wonderful study in 2005 that came out in the New England Journal, where he identified that there were about 190,000 cases of ARDS a year in the United States, with about 75,000 deaths. And so by way of reference. These, this is three or four year old data um, from the CDC. We're in, I think, 2011 this came from. Breast cancer deaths was 40,000 a year and prostate cancer deaths was 28,000 a year. And so while I'm pretty confident that our neighbors have a pretty good idea that breast cancer is really a bad problem and that prostate cancer is really a bad problem, I'm also confident that they know nothing about acute respiratory distress syndrome. And in fact, it kills more people a year than these two combined. And we anticipate that that's going to get worse, although that's the subject perhaps of some debate. So this is taken from a publication that the American Thoracic Society put together, and it's adapted from Gordon's New England Journal data, where this is the incidence uh, uh, cases per 100,000 person years on the y-axis. This is groups of ages, so increasing age to the right. 
This is the incidence for all patients, patients with sepsis, other risk factors, trauma contributes, but in a minor sort of way. And you can see that the mortality increases, but look what happens with increasing age and then think about our demographic. And so we'll make reference to this a little bit later, but that's a very intimidating alignment or potential alignment of circumstances that I think poses no small concern. So I'm going to tell you, if I may, a little bit about a story that's unfolding in our team about uh, bench-based investigation in acute lung injury, or ARDS. And I'm going to tell you through a series of snapshots, and if I hope that nobody walked in the door hoping to get sort of the in-depth mechanism about any one of these stories. We had to elect to leave somebody behind when you create a grand rounds, and I elected to leave those people behind if that's what they're after. But I'm going to give you a series of snapshots about observations that we have made that we think are relevant to trying to understand components of acute respiratory distress syndrome and maybe point towards therapies. Because what I described to you of those demographics, what I described to you of that mortality, sadly, there are no therapies for acute respiratory distress syndrome. We know that we uh, can manage patients better once they have it by adopting particular practices with a mechanical ventilator, but that's not really therapy, it's risk avoidance. And so we know the mortality goes down when you use low lung volumes as opposed to what had been historically higher lung volumes to ventilate patients. But we have no therapies for something that's killing tens of thousands of people a year. So I'm gonna, tell you the story, and Rob's alluded to one part of it as my perspective and my entry into it, but it, it, and I hope you'll indulge me with some of it because some of what I want to communicate is really less about the story and more about the experience. And so when I was an intern at Hopkins, July of my internship, I had a patient with spherocytosis. And I ran into a hematologist that I had met while interviewing and in, in the hall and said, hey, Chi, I I have a patient with spherocytosis, and he said, you know what, the world's expert in that is here. And you ought to call him. He's a really nice guy. So I called, and some of you may remember the old Maytag repair commercials where the guy just sits around waiting for the phone. Well, if you work on spherocytosis, you just don't get that many calls <laughs> from the house staff. And so I think before I had hung up the phone, uh, Peter Augury was in our team office to tell us a little bit about spherocytosis. And in fact, he had identified for a couple of red cell disorders, the molecular defect in spectrin, a red cell cytoskeletal protein that led to the shape problems and then some of the other altered physiology of a red cell and, and was very renowned for that work. And so we interacted over a period of a few years. And then as I was finishing my chief residency year and figuring out what I wanted to do in the lab as a pulmonary fellow, um, I became interested in an observation that Peter's team had made that had published in Science Magazine the year before about the identification of a molecule that let water go through, a protein that specifically let water go through. And so that sounded interesting. I'd done a couple of years of research in, at Vanderbilt with John Newman, as Rob alluded to, and was interested in edema. And so I joined Peter's lab and spent 10 years with him, basically, through being an associate professor, hunkered down on two benches, because at least at that time, it meant a lot more to me to be in a good neighborhood than it did to have my own room and door. And I had a fantastic experience. And so that was this, that's the lens from which this story starts. And so I'd relate just a couple of brief pieces. So this is a section of rat lung uh, stained with an antibody to aquaporin-1, which is on endothelium. And you can see that it's abundant in this endothelium around the airway, which would, be, which would be the bronchial circulation, which was a particular love of Dr. Butler's. This is from a human endothelial cell, an electron micrograph, where immunogold particles are labeling aquaporin-1, and you might not be able to see those quite as well as the big arrows that point to all of them, but abundant expression. And we had the opportunity to look at some rare individuals that had a deficiency of aquaporin-1. So there were six people in the world who were known to be missing aquaporin-1 because it was a blood group antigen. And so only six people had been identified. And we got a woman from France and a woman from the Southeast US to come in and go through a series of studies. And so as one of those, we adopted a protocol that Elias Sirhuni, when he was a radiologist at Hopkins and Robert Brown, an anesthesiologist, had used to look at airways and had used in dogs. And so here is a, is a CT slice 
uh, at baseline, and then we did serial fluid loading in a number of controls and in these two subjects. And we assessed changes in the airway wall thickness, right? So the timing difference of this study to this study is about 30 minutes. And then we could calculate by the morphometric uh, 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 approaches that Robert had identified the change in airway wall thickness of the controls, which looked like this, as opposed to the women that didn't have aquaporin 1, where there was no change, to indicate some function associated with the protein, which we'd like to think was relevant to the story that Peter ultimately told. We spent a lot of time characterizing a variety of aquaporins in different places in the airway, as well as the kidney and other places, function, regulation. And in fact, as Rob alluded to, that all worked out pretty well for Peter. But as well for the rest of us that had the privilege of working with Peter. So I'm going to park that to the side for a second because a number of years of aquaporin biology was the lens through which I was getting into this other story. And I want to tell you two different cases now. So the first is of a 53-year-old man who thinks that in the next day or two he's going to develop acute lung injury. So he calls you and he says, I need something because it's coming. So you give him antibiotics, cytoskeleton stabilizers, antioxidants, corticoid, anything that you think of that could go into that blank of things that have been shown to block this. And so he doesn't develop acute lung injury. So the other story is a 53-year-old man who has two to three days of fever and dyspnea, bilateral infiltrates, intubation, comes to the MICU and is on a ventilator for 21 days. So now the difference in those two stories is that the second story is the world we live in. And the first story is set up for probably 95 plus percent of the research that's been done in ARDS. That is to say, we know in extraordinary detail important information about the determinants of injury, in particularly the early events that determine injury, and they have been uniformly disappointing as targets for therapy for a variety of reasons. So we, want, we, are inter we became interested in thinking about that story. This uh, fuzzy picture is the most important part of this because I've had, a, had the chance to work with a great group and the stuff that I'm going to show you today, this fuzzy guy, Franco D'Alessio, uh, spearheaded a lot of this along with Neil Agarwal. I'm going to tell you something about Ben Singer, who's now a faculty member at Northwestern, Brian Garibaldi, who's still at Hopkins, and Clark Files, who's a faculty member at Wake Forest. And so what I'm going to tell you about is, is a very simple model where we give down the airway LPS, bacteria, or occasionally influenza into mice. And the only difference in what we were doing here as compared to lots and lots of people looking at lung injury in mice is that most of those studies lasted 24 hours. And we were very specifically interested in trying to understand something about the resolution. So we just tracked it out longer. And through multiple mouse strains, we could find pattern that looked like this, a control one day after LPS, you can see some uh, uh, infiltrate into the lung that's worse by day four and almost entirely gone away by day 10. So a pretty reproducible pattern. So our first foray into this through my lens of aquaporins was to say, can we get any clues from the abundance of aquaporins? And so this is a set of protein immunoblots where we're looking at the abundance of aquaporin one which is in the vascular endothelium, aquaporin 5, and the epithelium and the alpha subunit of the sodium potassium ATPase in control lice and 1, 4, and 10 days after exposure to LPS in four different strains of mice. Okay, and so now these are pretty blots, right? I think these are really pretty blots. You can see that there's a striking down regulation of the protein even within 24 hours for aquaporin 1 and aquaporin 5 and upregulate, you know, all very interesting. But as we pondered this, we basically said, holy crap, we will never make sense of this because this doesn't feel like it's going to be relevant to the story that we need to sort out. And just to, to digress slightly there, around this same window, my division director, I had an annual review with my then division director, a guy named Skip Garcia, who was a great friend. And, and I have vivid memories because the same day of this review, we had also done, I, I mentioned the studies in the two individuals that had um, aquaporin 1 deficiency. We had also done some renal studies with them. And so the same day I had this meeting with Skip, I got a letter from the New England Journal saying our paper in the New England Journal had been accepted about the renal function. So I pop into Skip's office and he says, hey, I've been thinking about it. I think you need to diversify away from those aquaporin studies. 
and he didn't quite suck all the oxygen out of the room, <laughs> but I got a little hypoxemic sitting there. But he was right. He was exactly right. This was not, the kidney's really simple. No, no, nothing to the nephrologist in the group. It's a bunch of straight tubes, and on every cell, we know exactly which way the arrow points for all those transporters. <laughs> the reflection of an immense amount of work and insight, but relatively speaking, as an experimental model, it's very simple, as opposed to the arborization in the lung and where we still don't know which way things transport sometimes. It's very challenging. And so Skip was a great colleague, and, and this story is to say being a great colleague is more than just cheering. He was a great colleague because with all sincerity and investment, he said, I think you need to think about taking this story in a different direction. And so we were also persuaded of that because we really wanted to understand this transition. And so within those mice, we had looked at cell, this is lavage, alveolar lavage cell counts from these strains of mice and lots of cells at day one and it goes way down by day 10. Lots of macrophages at the start, they go way down because the neutrophils go way up. All of that's interesting. But what caught our attention was this, this increase in lymphocytes. And I think Franco and I could spell immunology at that point, but we really couldn't get much beyond that but we were really interested in this group of lymphocytes and whether that they meant anything to that resolution. And so Franco undertook some studies that were pretty simple in some respects. So this is now uh, uh, recombinase activating gene one deficient mice. Those are mice that do not have an enzyme that's necessary for lymphocyte differentiation. So they have no lymphocytes. So if you just take those mice and you expose them to LPS, as compared to wild types, there's about a 15% mortality in the wild type mice and about a 50% mortality in the mice that don't have lymphocytes. The mice that, the wild type mice lose weight and then gain it all back. The RAG1 mice that don't have lymphocytes lose the weight and don't gain it back. And as a mouse clinician from the end of the cage, you would say that mouse is sick. Pilo erection, doesn't move, huddles, just looks sick. And then if you look at the lung histology, this is the wild type, and it looks just like what I showed you before with resolution. And if you didn't have lymphocytes, there was no resolution. And so we were interested in the possibility that there was a contribution of those lymphocytes and wanted to refine that. And in a serendipitous way, a person named Ethan Shevak, who was from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease and an immunologist, was given a talk at Hopkins that Franco happened to attend, maybe more than happened to attend, on regulatory T cells. And so I'm gonna skip a lot of things and just say we got interested in regulatory T cells, which is a subset of lymphocytes that are marked by being CD4 positive, CD25 positive. This is a subunit of the interleukin-2 receptor and it expresses a transcription factor, FOXP3. So this is flow cytometry. So the cells that are 4, 25, and FOXP3 positive are in the upper right quadrant. And so we could track the expression of those as compared to spleen, and, and so at least in a circumstantial way, it looked like there was an increase in Tregs that was at least consistent with this time course of resolution. And so then Franco did a pretty definitive experiment. We took RAG1 null mice, so this is the control. This is a RAG1 null mice that gets LPS, gets PBS uh, intravenously, which is the sham, and then at 10 days later, the lung looks like that. So then if you isolate particular lymphocyte fractions and you give them back, these were, these were given by tail vein, one hour after the LPS. So if you give back these lymphocytes, and now we do it by retroorbital injection. And so if you give back CD8 cells, there's no resolution. If you give back CD4 positive cells, but not Tregs, there's no resolution. If you just give back isolated Tregs to this mouse that has no other lymphocytes, you get complete resolution. And I'm showing the histology. There's a lot of parameters that we look at in terms of that. And so it corrects this almost entirely. We looked at it in a different direction, and so I'll just briefly, we got a mouse from a guy named Alexander Rudensky at Sloan Kettering. I just told you that FOXP3 was important in these regulatory T cells, and so Dr. Rudensky took the FOXP3 gene and hooked it to the diphtheria toxin receptor gene, okay? So that uh, cells expressing FOXP3 would also express the diphtheria toxin receptor. So if you then gave the mouse diphtheria toxin, 
you would kill all of the cells expressing FOX T3. So we, so we could get a selective knockout of regulatory T cells. Okay? And so when we knocked out regulatory T cells, that's the Treg depleted group as opposed to the non-depleted group, we see a mortality change. BAL protein is high in the Treg depleted group. The cell counts are high and consistent with what I showed you, they don't resolve. And so from either direction, either addition or subtraction, we have a really strong story to say regulatory T cells matter. Because um, reviewers for different things, grants, manuscripts, they get a manual, right? And in big font at the top of the manual, it says, pick on things, okay? <laughs> That's their job. It's like the header, every page, pick on something. So the question was raised, what about infectious models? Because this is a LPS is a sterile model. And, and is mucking with regulatory T cells one way or the other going to have an impact in an infectious model? And so just again, as snapshots, this is now using that diphtheria toxin, FOXP3 mouse, and pneumococcus. And so in the mice that have depletion of T regs and get pneumococcus, mortality is greater. And there's no resolution now to pneumococcus. And I don't show you the histology, but similar when we put influenza down the airway. Mortality is greater when they don't have regulatory T cells. Cell counts greater and the histology is similar to what I just showed you. So several circumstantial things or more to say that regulatory T cells seem to occupy a very interesting position in this transition from injury to repair. Because the mortality I've shown you for any of these is not in the first 24 hours. It starts out at about day four. So we think it has something to do with not being present to mediate or orchestrate that transition. Again, in a phenomenologic way, there are other pieces that members of the team got interested in. So Brian Garibaldi got interested in the fibrosis that we were seeing in this model. And so a very surprising observation for us is when we stained these lungs for collagen, this is three days after LPS, there was an extraordinary amount of collagen present in the lung. We had no idea. Nobody else had any idea. People were very surprised as we talked about this. But somehow the lung mobilizes that collagen, right? In the absence of lymphocytes, it doesn't mobilize that collagen. And you can quantify the collagen. This is now in the gray bars of RAG1 mice that don't have lymphocytes. And so the collagen is elevated. If you give them back regulatory T cells, it comes back down to normal or it clears just like a wild type mouse. To give it back non-T-regs, uh, non it doesn't clear, and the histology is consistent with that. And then Jason Mock, who is now at UNC, became interested in the epithelial response in the context of this model. So in Brian's story, we identified that there was a strong signal for the recruitment of a cell called a fibrocyte to the lung, and that, that appeared to play a prominent role somehow, either directly or indirectly, and we don't know, in stimulating the production of this collagen. And those fibrocytes were recruited by a signal, a chemokine CXCL12 that interacted with CXCR4 on the fibrocyte, and we could block CXCR4. And we showed that the CXCL12 that was the signal to pull in the fibrocytes came from the epithelium. So Jason got interested in as an extension of that and understanding more about the presence or absence of Tregs on the epithelial response. So now this is CD326 labels epithelial cells. And so now we're looking at the proliferation of epithelial cells in the lung. This is just, the, and now this is again, the depletion of, uh, this is the control of that fox 3 mouse. And the black bar is the mouse that's had Tregs depleted. So if you give LPS, there is a big increase. LPS plus the theria toxin, there, there's a big increase in the control mice, but in the mice that don't have Tregs, that is cut in half. And we could go through by subtypes in terms of the replacement approach, so that now these are done in RAG1 null mice that don't have lymphocytes. This is the wild tap my, uh, mouse seven days after LPS. There's a striking increase in proliferation of epithelial cells. No lymphocytes, that's suppressed. If you give back regulatory T cells, it comes back to normal baseline levels. If you give back non-Tregs, uh, we think there's an admixture of Tregs in this. There's sort of an intermediate response, but it's not back to normal. And I won't go into it, but there's a particular mo molecule on a Treg, CD103, which is an integrin, 
that is important to the function of the Treg. And so if we gave back Tregs that did not have this molecule, CD103, again, there was no change. And so now we've got the Tregs doing a lot of different things. I am not haven't shown you any of the data about the host of inflammatory components that are mediated. I'm just telling you in a phenomenologic way that collagen uh, dynamics are different in the presence and absence of Tregs and the epithelial proliferation and function, which I won't show you here, is different in the presence or absence of Tregs. And so then finally, this question, could Tregs be a drug? Could you just give Tregs and treat lung injury? And so we did that in a couple of ways. First, this is now a RAG1 null mice that don't have lymphocytes. And so we just give them back a million Tregs 24 hours after the LPS, and they get complete resolution. In fact, we can give it 48 hours after the LPS in the world of experimental lung injury, unheard of, and get complete resolution. So there's something very special about the ability of that cell to orchestrate a resolution. So we also looked in wild-type mice. What if we just gave more Tregs to a mouse that had its own Tregs? So now this is a wild-type mouse that gets twice the normal dose of LPS. So instead of uh, it gets twice the normal dose, and uh, the mortality is about 50%, as opposed to the 15% I told you about earlier. And then we give those wild-type mice back Tregs, they get complete resolution and the mortality is reduced back to normal levels. So even having your own complement of Tregs, maybe there's some hope for treating it like a drug. And so just as an intermediate uh, step in our journey here, we have a lot of data that says that there's an interesting interaction between a regulatory T cell and a macrophage. We haven't spent a whole lot of time talking about the macrophage piece of that, but we understand that there are a number of players in that story that have some complicated interactions that we have teased out to some extent in some of the sampling of papers, but there's still work going on, and we know it involves inducible nitric oxide synthase. It involves that surface molecule CD103, and I'll speak to this a little bit in just one second, this, uh, this uh, molecule CD86, and that somehow this interaction orchestrates a reduction of inflammation, a resolution of fibrosis, and repair of the epithelium in a variety of models of injury in a mouse. We're interested in the notion of being able to come up with a therapy. So I'm going to tell you two brief stories in that regard. So co-signaling molecules are important in the interaction between an antigen presenting cell and a T cell. And so there's two axes for that interaction. One is the MHC molecule on the antigen presenting cell and the T cell receptor. And the second axis is a co-signaling ligand and a co-signaling receptor. And there's a family of these molecules, and depending on how they engage, they can significantly modulate the response of the T cell and the antigen presenting cell. So this family of molecules regulate this interaction, or at least modulate that interaction. And we had made the observation in a number of these studies that in a variety of circumstances, including when inducible nitric oxide synthase was not present, or when Tregs were not present, this surface molecule, CD86, was markedly upregulated in macrophages. That's to suggest that somehow the interaction with the Tregs was playing some role in that. And so we did a pretty simple thing. <clears throat> so anti-CD86 is available. It's used in some oncology studies now. So we took a wild-type mouse. We gave it twice the usual dose of LPS. And two days after the LPS, we gave it uh, uh, intravenously anti-CD86. Okay, so now this uh, mouse is just getting a single molecule, this antibody, and we get complete resolution. Okay, And what we also observed was when we gave back anti-CD86 antibodies, there was an increase, this is a flow cytometry, increase in the number of regulatory C cells. So there's some complicated interaction between the Treg, the macrophage, and some of the molecules that I, in a very, very superficial way, called out to you that we think is important. But now the notion that you could identify a molecular target, as opposed to needing to think about the complexity of giving back regulatory T cells, right? So not so hard in a mouse, because you can get homogeneous mice, and I can take some Tregs from this mouse, and today, or you know, an hour later, I can give it into that mouse. Not that simple in humans. And so in places where regulatory T cells are being used as therapy, for example, graft versus host disease or some other inflammatory models, you take the cells out, you expand them, and then three weeks later, 
you give them back, and, and at least our experience is that's not that convenient for ARDS and the MIDCU. Three weeks, hang in there, we'll be back. <laughs> not so good, right? So we're interested in the notion that there are some molecular targets that one could tease out of this. The second very cursory story I want to tell you here about this is methylation, DNA methylation in regulatory T cells. So the FOXP3 gene that I mentioned to you is required for the expression of, of a number of molecules in a regulatory T cell that give it its suppressive activity. Okay. The FOXP3 gene is regulated by methylation in the cell. So when it is methylated, it is turned off. And when it is demethylated, it is available to then be turned on. Okay. So 5-Aza-2-deoxycytidine, uh, more easily as DAC in the next couple of slides, is a small molecule that blocks DNA methyltransferases that affect this methylation event. Okay? And so in the presence of DAC blocking a DNA methyltransferase, then it is possible to demethylate a site. Right? So Ben Singer, who I mentioned is now at Northwestern, undertook a study to look at the effect of giving DAC to block methylation. Now this could work in an indiscriminate way all all over the place, and that's an issue, and we'll speak to that in a second. But if you just give DAC interperitoneally starting two days after the LPS, then you see that in the mice that only get vehicle, okay, and now again, these are, um, so we, we see in the mice that only get vehicle uh, that they don't gain weight. The mice that get the DAC uh, gain weight. BAL protein is decreased in the mice that got the DAC as compared to the controls. Similarly for cell counts, a big reduction in neutrophils. And this isn't the prettiest thing in the world, but you get some hint, at least in the higher power view, that there's some uh, early resolution. Now this is only day five, and as I pointed, day four, day five is usually the peak of our injury. So we're seeing at least some early resolution. So this could have been manifest in a variety of ways. One would predict that if it was going to be relevant in terms of this Treg axis that you should be able to see some Treg effects from this and in fact when you take the Tregs out <clears throat> you see that this is the vehicle control and this is the DAC treated mice at day two looking at total lung Tregs. By day five there's a striking increase in total lung T cells, uh, total lung T cell Tregs in the um, uh, context of DAC treatment. This is flow cytometry. CD4 is a molecule on a Treg that is a marker of activation of the Treg. And this is the control, is the blue line, and the pink is the uh, DC, DAC treated, and it's shifted to the right, and here it's quantitated. So there's an increase in CD44. There's an increase in CD39. That's a molecule on the surface of a Treg that's an enzyme that cleaves ATP. And it's thought to be an important part of how a Treg mediates inflammation is to cleave extracellular ATP that's available in the environment so it is no longer participating in the inflammatory response. And CTLA-4 is a ligand that interacts with other cells to downregulate function in those cells, and there's a modest increase here. So at least, again, consistent with the notion that giving DAC, in fact, produced the changes in regulatory T cells that would allow you to keep a straight face and saying, we think the regulatory T cells have something to do with this. Then if you do this experiment, in mice from which you have selectively deleted the regulatory T cells, and I won't subject you to the data, but if you just selectively deplete the regulatory T cells with diphtheria toxin and you give DAC, there's no effect of the DAC. Okay? There is no resolution. So it appears that the regulatory T cells are necessary. And then Ben did what I thought was a pretty clever thing. So he took, the, took um, mice that had a depletion of regulatory T cells, he took regulatory T cells out of other mice and he exposed them to DAC or a normal vehicle control ex vivo and then he gave them back. But when he gave them back, he didn't give them back in the usual dose, which is a million cells per mice per mouse by retroorbital injection is how we get them in. He gave back only 200,000 cells and we had a lot of done a lot of work to say that for all those other studies I told you about, if you just gave back 200,000 cells, you didn't get anything. It was not sufficient to mediate the uh, resolution. Okay, and so 
Here, you give back 200,000 cells that DAC treated. There is a reduction in the total cell count. There's an increase in Tregs, and you get resolution. And so now this is ex vivo treatment of cells. And so we're very interested in the possibility that somewhere in this mix that I've just described to you, that there is actually a pharmacological treatment that would selectively upregulate or preferentially upregulate regulatory T cells and become available to us as therapies. And so for the last little bit, I'm gonna tell you about a, a, a different twist on this story. So we talked about the fact that there's a lot of death, but there's also a lot of survivors. And in fact, we know from the work of Margaret Herridge and Terry Huff here and Dale Needham in our place and others, that the people who survive have challenges. So there's a weight loss in those individuals. If you look at the distance walked in six minutes, three months later, it's only half of the predicted, a year later, they only can walk two thirds of the predicted distance. A small percentage of them are able to turn, return to work. Dale quantified muscle function in these individuals with a MRC scale, five point scale in 20 muscle groups and then created an aggregate score to say you're either weak or not weak. And so if you look at individuals with ARDS, three months after they get out of the MICU, 62% have weakness, almost half, two years later, are still demonstrably weak. So we became interested because we had this chronic model and although it's not where we'll focus today, we had a T-reg hook into this story. We became interested in leveraging our model to try to understand something about that weakness. And so Clark Files, who's now at Wake Forest, looked in the soleus muscle, a mixed fiber type muscle in the calf of a mouse. So these are sections in a mouse 10 days after LPS. This is a control. This is a mouse 10 days after LPS. And then I won't focus on this, but mice that have get LPS stop eating. So Clark, in a very rigorous way, quantified how much they ate and had a separate group of mice that only got access to the same amount of food that the LPS mice had gotten. So they're a pair feeding group. That's what the PF means to control for food intake. This is a histogram of fiber sizes and the black is the control mice. And you can see there's a leftward shift suggesting there's smaller fibers in the pair feeding and the ALI mice and quantitated there. You could take the mouse and put its foot on a force transducer, a plate that's a force transducer, and then electrically stimulate the muscle to quantify force transduction. And so when you do that in the control mice, which is in the black, you get a curve that looks like that. The parafed mice, even though the fibers were smaller, had normal force generation, but the lung injury mice had reduced force generation. They were weak. There are two genes that are turn on atrophy programs in muscle. One's called MRF1, one's atrogen. And we became interested in the notion that MRF1 might play some role in this. We'll just skip that blot. And so we developed a short hairpin RNA to silence MRF1. Clark would inject it into the calf of the mouse and then put little electrical plates on the side of the mouse calf and discharge to get electroporation of the DNA into the calf. And in fact, you get extraordinary uptake into the muscle of this construct and can silence MRF1 in the muscle. And so when you do that, this is the control mice and you can look at that fiber size. This is the mice that, the mouse that had silencing of MRF1 and you can quantify that. This is the control mouse that had lung injury as the first uh, uh, point of contact in our experiment, and it has smaller muscle fibers. And if you silence MRF1, it has increased fiber size. And in fact, you get a restoration of the force generation, right? And so now you could selectively go in on the muscle weakness, perhaps, and imagine, okay, out of this story, can you do something to impact on the weakness or can you understand those mechanics? So to the initial figure of things that we are interested in out of this axis, and I put a dotted line because this started, the first observations were out of the T-reg story. But most of the work Clark's done, including we had a paper in Science Translational Medicine last year where he showed the effect of exercise in mice to reverse some of this in terms of the lung injury. So we're interested in all those axes. So let, let's get out of here. So ARDS in 2030, this is from Gordon's paper. I told you initially 190,000 cases and 75,000 deaths, right? And so if you just take 
that data, and then you look at the demographics and play it out against that curve that showed the effect of aging, this is what Gordon predicted, 335,000 cases and 147,000 deaths. So if that is true, that's really intimidating. None of us has the capacity to manage that, right? And still we are in the absence of therapies. Now, as we talked about at dinner last night, it's a little bit up in the air as to whether something is different about how we're managing a variety of things to change those numbers, and we hope so, but it's a big problem. Treg macrophage interaction orchestrates complex resolution biology, and again, I, I apologize, I just showed you a series of snapshots behind which there's a fair amount of data to indicate this is a pretty special interaction that we think is important for that resolution. We think there may be actual targets emerging, and we're actually working towards trying to set up a trial on that uh, methylation story. <clears throat> if you're interested in investing, I would be happy to take checks at the end of the session. And then importantly with this, along with colleagues like Terry Huff and Dale Needham who are doing work on the clinical side of the story, there are a lot of dimensions to this. And while my story focused mostly on the lung injury piece until that last little bit, it's very clear that weakness and that neurologic and psychi psychiatric dysfunction are prominent in people who have survived ARDS and that we have an obligation to try to understand those dimensions of this story as well. Okay? So this is, this is the scientific part of the story. But, but I want to steal just another minute or two from you. So it's a really special thing. It's a really special thing to have a named lectureship for you. I'm sorry Dr. Butler's not here to engage with us. It's a very special thing. It, it means that your colleagues came together to say not just that we want to create resources, but that we want to create an occasion to recognize you for doing a number of things. And I'm not pretending to have known Dr. Butler personally, but I did ask some colleagues at Hopkins who, Charlie Weiner was a resident and chief resident here in your program. He's now a vice president in Johns Hopkins International. He's a pulmonologist. Charlie had incredibly affectionate things to say about Dr. Butler, including being called a cheeky intern by Dr. Butler one day in the MICU. Bob Wise, who is a renowned COPD investigator at our place and a revered figure in our place, early in his career was working with a senior person at Hopkins who's no longer with us, for whom we have a name lecture, Paul Permit, on heart-lung interactions and the physiology of heart-lung interactions and talked at some length about how important and how passionate Dr. Butler was about that. Elizabeth Wagner is a professor at Hopkins who drank the same Kool-Aid as Dr. Butler with regard to the bronchial circulation that really it's a very small group of people that care about. The rest of us are wrong because it's important. But she, with great conviction, talked about how um, consistently and how intently he helped a young woman trying to develop an academic career find her way. And they were together part of the Da Vinci Society that was created to talk about the bronchial circulation at national meetings. And so I get the sense from a distance that Dr. Butler was a very special person who called out important things and probably made all of us a little bit better as a result of that. And so with that, I'm just going to say, why are we here? And, and you may actually at this point be saying, Lord God, why did I come to Grand Rounds today? And I think your judgment would be intact if that's what you were thinking. But, you know, I, I have this intense bias that, that I'm in a special place, but also that you're in a very special place. And that's what I was alluding to in these conversations some years ago with Rob, where we, um, uh, in our day jobs, collectively, we make magic happen on a regular basis. And sometimes it's what you do at the bedside. But one of the unifying things, I think, is also that we are enriched for people who want to do something more than just take the best possible care of the person in front of them. They want to generate ideas and work that are going to impact on patients at a distance. And I think we share that. And it's an important part of our opportunity, but in my view, it's also an important part of our responsibility. And as Robert and I were talking about earlier this morning, it is really hard to get yourself to Grand Rounds these days. In our place, your place, everybody, there are so many pressures to check boxes, 
and to get funded and to do other things that it's very hard to pick you up and say, you know, I think it's in my interest to participate in the social activity of academic medicine. It's in my interest to go to a lecture where I might hear about regulatory T cells. And it's in my interest to hear about things where my colleagues, or participate in things where my colleagues can say, you know, I think you need to course correct. But it's really hard. It takes a lot of intention. And so at a time where the physician scientist is under threat, frankly, uh, but we have a lot of questions that we need to solve together, I um, applaud you for coming to a very special place to train and to work and uh, hope that together we can figure out how to create a space where the kinds of things that I suspect Dr. Butler spent time calling out as important, as reflected in his colleague's intention in creating a named lecture for him, aren't lost. And that despite these other challenges, we figure out together how to navigate to really manage a lot of important things that I think the public expects of us and increasingly is asking of us in terms of the scrutiny that they um, undertake over our work, but the incredible resources that we are seeking for them. So with that, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be with you. Landon, thanks so much for that talk. Not so much a question, but just a comment. Your career has spanned mechanics, pulmonary circulation, pumps and uh, flows, and has evolved into molecules at the cellular level and now T regulatory systems. And I just want to point out to the audience that that evolution from a physiologist to an immunologist and a cellular biologist is remarkable and something that we have the privilege of being able to do within academics to be able to determine our course, what we're interested in, and the passions that we have to follow those interests. And I think you did a really nice job highlighting that for the group and showing how it fits into academic medicine today. So thank, thank you I, so I much. I agree with for you that. entirely. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi. Hi. And uh, so getting back to the science a little bit, um, you talked a lot about the interaction on the kind of cell contact level, uh, cell uh, receptors uh, interacting with cell-cell contact, but um, you didn't talk about soluble mediators much that might be involved in the uh, resolution phase mm -hmm. and how they might be targets mm -hmm. for uh, therapy, because certainly there are a lot of opportunities out there, um, molecules, as you mentioned, that have been targeted in cancer mm -hmm. uh, that might be opportunities in ARDS. Yeah, and I, I, all I can really say is I agree with you. We, we have focused in particular places, but not to suggest that there is no world outside of those places. And the only really soluble side of this was around the CD86 story, as well as back in that fibrocyte uh, collagen story the regulation of the CXCL12, CXCR4 interaction. Um, but I, I agree with the notion entirely. I, I think we were looking for ways to, um, to identify targets, and it's an ongoing story. But thank you. So my question is, um, you know, the, I guess the big question is the patient who has severe persistent ARDS. You know, it's very tempting to, th very tempting to think that they have some kind of impairment in the T-REC response. But another possibility is that they have a very robust T-REC response and yet the, whatever is it that triggered this persistent fibrotic inflammatory response is overwhelming. And it's overwhelming the T-REC response that the patient has. Uh, I suppose it could be seen by looking at flow cytometry from VO fluids or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, have you done anything like that? Do you have any insight on that issue? So, we, thank you. That's a great observation. So, we um, we have done some things. You know, so, we have some correlative data, some suggestive data about upregulation of regulatory T cells and expression on macrophages of certain molecules that that are at least consistent with our findings in the in vitro studies. So, we we have um, we have been hamstrung in this. We had a we had a study subject die 
at Hopkins in the early 2000s in an asthma study with a bronchovular lavage receiving a drug that provoked a, a, a mortal reaction in this individual. And we, as a result, have had extremely limited access to um, alveolar lavage in critically ill patients. So Franco is leading the charge. He, so I mentioned that Clark Files, who was with us as a fellow, is now at Lake Forest. And so Franco and Clark have created uh, an opportunity there. We have reached out to a few other uh, uh, friends and are, are assembling the mechanics around either flow cytometry there or somehow uh, preserving things for flow cytometry with the goal of developing um, you know, some set of observations in humans that's going to both inform what we would do but also lead credibility to some of the things that we think one could undertake as trials relatively quickly. Um, we've got some data that looks pretty promising on that, but it's early and it's limited. And again, we've got this mechanical issue that we've not been able to pursue that in the way we had hoped or imagined uh, at Hopkins alone. And um, aligning with partners around this has also taken a little more time than we had hoped. But I, I think it's a fantastic idea. We wish we were further downstream and actually executing it. I have a question more related to the regulatory T cell uh, contribution. The autoimmune phenomena associated with congenital deficiency of FOXP3 includes a variety of autoimmune phenomena. And I don't recall that inflammatory lung disease is part of that. Do you know if people have? look back either at the mouse models or humans with FOXP3 deficiency, IPEX? I, yeah, I agree. we, we uh, agree with the starting point that it has been conspicuous in its absence. And I'm not aware that anybody has undertaken to look at it, but it, it appears to us that at least in that context and expressed that way, there's not a prominent lung finding because they've been pretty rigorous clinical analyses and, and nobody's called it out. And then perhaps related to that, do you know if the regulatory T cells are uh, the uh, natural Tregs or inducible Tregs in terms of where their origin might be? Yeah, um, I don't know in as clean a way as you just asked. Uh, but, and and I, what I mean with that is I, I don't, I think it is actually both. And so we have some phenotyping to suggest that it's both. Um, but. I, I, I can call somebody and ask them if we're over, but I, I can't tell you as we sit here. But I think that's a, that's a, a very interesting observation. Th there are some interesting phenotypic differences that at least we see uh, uh, in those, both in terms of what we've done in vivo and what we've done ex vivo. And so we're, we're trying to understand that a little bit better. So we'll go ahead and close there. Thank you very much. Thank you.